Good evening. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and for having me tonight. Thank you to everyone in attendance for joining me to discuss this very important topic, signs of a mini stroke in women. Stroke is the number five cause of death and a leading cause of disability in the United States. A stroke occurs when part of the brain is damaged because of a problem with blood flow. It could be because an artery going to the brain gets clogged and part of the brain goes without blood for too long. On the other hand, it could be because an artery breaks and it starts bleeding into or around the brain. When now let's let's discuss what would be a mini stroke. We use the term mini stroke when we are referring to a transit ischemic attack. The Transit ischemic attack is a TIA, how we commonly refer to. And it also happens when blood flow in the brain is blocked, but for a short period of time and then reopens on its own. Then the patient could have just transient symptoms, the similar stroke symptoms, but just for a shorter, short period of time. Then what would be the difference between a TIA or mini stroke and a stroke. They have the same symptoms, and we are going to discuss the symptoms in just a little bit. The TIA doesn't cause a permanent damage to the brain like a stroke does. So the TIA symptoms usually last only a few minutes. However, they may persist for up to 24 hours. On the other hand, with a stroke, the symptoms are la long lasting. But when the symptoms first start, it's going to be very difficult to know if a person is having a TIA or a stroke. If you have a TIA, you are at high risk of having a stroke. And the risk is highest in the first few days after a TIA. That's why it's important that you see a doctor and take steps to prevent that from happening. So do not ignore the symptoms of a stroke, even if they go away. Now, how can you tell if someone is having a mini stroke or a stroke? There is an easy way to remember the signs of a stroke. First, those symptoms usually come on suddenly, out of the blue. So just think of the term B fast. Each letter in the word stands for one of the things you should watch for and what to do about it. B stands for balance. Is the person having trouble standing or walking? E stands for eyes. Is the person having trouble with their vision? It could be double vision. It could be vision loss in one part of the visual field or complete vision loss in one eye. F stands for face. Does the person's face look uneven or there is a droop in one side of the face? A stands for arm. Does a person have weakness or numbness in one arm or in both arms? Does one arm drift down if the person tries to hold both arms out? The S stands for speech. Is the person having trouble speaking? So it could be a slurred speech. It could be difficulties understanding what we are telling them. It could be even like a speech that it makes no sense, having difficulties finding the words. And finally, T stands for time. But if you notice any of these stroke signs, call for an ambulance. Dial 911 because you need to act fast. The sooner the treatment begins, the better the chances of recovery. What would be the risk factors associated with the TIA or mini stroke and stroke? So risk factors are divided in two main groups. There are stroke risk factors that you can control, treat, and improve. And one of the most important of those risk factors is high blood pressure. It is actually a leading cause of stroke and the most significant controllable risk factor. Another important risk factor is smoking. 
the nicotine and the carbon monoxide in the cigarette smoke damage the cardiovascular system, and that increases the risk for a stroke. It's also important to keep in mind that the use of birth control pills combined with cigarette smoking can greatly increase the risk of a stroke in women. Another important risk factor is diabetes. So if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, it is important to keep the blood sugar in good control. This is an important risk factor for a stroke. And also many people who have diabetes have other medical conditions that increase the risk for a stroke, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and overweight. The next risk factor that we're going to discuss is the diet. Diet that is a diet that is high in fats, cholesterol can rise the blood cholesterol levels. Those that are high in salt can increase the blood pressure. And those diets that are high in calories can lead to obesity. On the other hand, a diet that contains five or more servings of fruits and vegetables per day may reduce the risk of a stroke. Next, we can discuss the physical inactivity and obesity. The physical inactivity can increase your risk of a stroke, but also the risk for heart disease, obesity, high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, and diabetes. So it's important to aim for being active at least 150 minutes a week. But if for some reasons you cannot get to that activity level, at least it's important to move, to move more and sit less. Another important risk factor that we have also discussed earlier when we were discussing about the diet is the high blood cholesterol. Other important risk factors that can also be treated and improved is carotid artery disease. The carotid arteries are the arteries that <laughs> travel in the neck and bring the blood to a big part of the brain. When patients have atherosclerosis, that is a plaque built up in the carotid arteries, then they can develop a blood clot in that narrow vessel, and that can cause a stroke. Another condition is peripheral artery disease. This is when the narrowing occurs in the blood vessels that go to the leg and the arms. And also it's caused for, because of plaques build up in the arteries. The people people who have peripheral artery disease have a higher risk for carotid artery disease, and that increases the risk for a stroke. Another important condition is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a frequent condition that we encounter as the population ages, and that predisposes to a clot formation in the heart. That clot can break loose and then travel to different areas of the body, including the brain, and can cause stroke. Other heart diseases also increase the risk for a stroke, including coronary artery disease, heart failure, dilated cardiomyopathy, heart valve disease, and sometimes, of course, sometimes types of congenital heart defects can also raise the risk for a stroke. On the other hand, there are risk factors that are not within our control. And the most important of them is age. So the likelihood of having a stroke increases with age for both males and females. Although stroke is more common among the elderly, a lot of people under 65 years old also have a stroke. Another important risk factor is a family history. So if you have a close relative, such as a parent, grandparent, sibling who has had a stroke, especially when this has happened before age 65, you may be at greater risk. Race and gender also play an important role in the stroke risk factors. African-Americans have a much higher risk of death from a stroke than Caucasians do. And this is partly because Black people have higher risks of high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. 
gender, we will discuss in a little bit more in detail, but it's important to know that overall, women have more strokes than men, and a stroke kills more women than men. So as we discussed before, when a patient has had a TIA or a heart attack, increases the risk of a stroke. Also, when a patient has a definitive stroke, the risk of a subsequent stroke is higher. A person who has had one or more mini strokes is almost 10 times more likely to have a stroke than someone of the same age and sex who hasn't had a TIA or mini stroke. There are other risk factors associated with a stroke, and one of them is COVID-19. In the last few years, we have been uh, an associate, we have seen an association of COVID-19 infection resulting in blood clot formation leading to a stroke. Also, the geographic location, socioeconomic factors are important. So strokes are more common in the southeastern states, and it's called the stroke belt states. Also, strokes may be more common among those with lower incomes. One reason may be due to higher smoking and obesity rates, and another reason may be that the access to quality health care is often more limited among those with lower incomes. Other important risk factor is the alcohol abuse and drug abuse. The most commonly abused drugs, such as cocaine, amphetamines, heroin, have been associated with an increased risk of a stroke. And the last risk factor that we're going to discuss is sleep apnea. So there has been an associator, association between a sleep apnea and a stroke in both directions. So patients that have a sleep apnea have an increased risk for a stroke. And also we have seen sometimes that our patients after having a stroke may develop a sleep apnea. So overall it's important for patients who have a sleep apnea to have that treating and under good control to try to decrease the risk for a stroke. Now, now let's, let's discuss a stroke in women. This a graphic shows the heart disease and stroke statistics according to age in the United States in 2019. As you can see, the prevalence of a stroke is similar between men and women up to 59 years of age. In the group 60 to 79 is higher in men, that is the blue color, and in the age group of 80 years of age, and more, the incidence of a stroke is higher in women. So women can have more severe strokes. Actually, a stroke is the number four cause of death in women. And the worst outcomes are a result of several factors, including older age at the time of stroke onset, the worst pre-stroke functional status, and multiple comorbidities. The probability of death in the first year after a stroke in men and women also differs widely by age and ethnicity, with the first group being conformed by the white women older than 75 years of age and followed by white men. As we discussed before, the stroke symptoms, the most frequent ones would be problems with the vision, with the speech, with the movements, with the sensation, the balance. But it's important to recognize that women may report symptoms that are different from the common symptoms. And they can include loss of consciousness or fainting, generalized weakness, changes in the mental status, including confusion, unresponsiveness, disorientation, behavioral changes, agitation, hallucinations, and even seizures could be a way that a strokes can present. Now let's talk about the treatment. How is a TIA treated? So let's remember that a TIA or mini stroke is when the symptoms last a short period of time. 
So it's frequent that when we see the patients already in the hospital or in the clinic, the symptoms had resolved. So that's why in the case of a mini stroke or TIA, the treatment is directed at reducing the risk that the person will actually have a stroke. When the patients come to the hospital for evaluation, we will do several tests, including blood tests, CAT scans, MRI, pictures of the blood vessel that can be obtained with CAT scan, with MRI or the ultrasound of the neck. And for some patients, it's also important to get ultrasound of the heart and a monitor of the heart. And all these tests are performed to look for the cause of the mini stroke or the stroke. Now, for the patients that actually had a stroke, that when they come to us, the symptoms are still present, the right treatment depends on the kind of a stroke that the patient is having. But it's important to get to the hospital as quickly as possible to figure this out. Remember at the beginning, we were discussing that there are two main types of a stroke. One type of a stroke is when an artery gets blocked. So when the patients come to us with this kind of a stroke, there are two main treatments that nowadays we can offer to the patients. The first treatment is a medication that is given in the vein to try to open the blood vessels. The problem with that medication is that there is a short time window to um, be offered to the patients. It's most of the time up to 4.5 hours since the symptoms have been started. And beyond that, we don't usually use the medication because the risk for bleeding is going to be too high and the benefits are not going to be the same as the time passes. The other uh, treatment that nowadays we have available for some patients is a catheter procedure trying to get to the exact point where the blood vessel is blocked and try to open that blood vessel. So those two treatments are in, or intend to help recover from the stroke. After that, there are some medicines that can be given to prevent new clots from forming and prevent future strokes. On the other hand, for the patients that had the second type of a stroke, that is a bleeding, when a blood vessel ruptures inside the brain, there are some treatments that may reduce the damage caused by the bleeding inside the brain. For patients that are taking blood thinner medications, we'll be stopping at least for a certain period of time those medications, and sometimes they will need even other medicines that can revert that blood thinner effect of those medications. And in some situations, patients will need to have a surgery to try to repair the blood vessel. Now, it's important to discuss how we can prevent a stroke. So remember, mini stroke or TIA and a stroke are very similar. The way that we prevent a stroke from happening includes two main things. One is trying to decrease the risk factors. And that could be with medicines and also with lifestyle, lifestyle changes. So there are medicines that can decrease the risk of a stroke and mainly there are medicines to treat the blood pressure, the cholesterol, such as statins, also medicines that will help to keep the blood sugar as close to normal as possible for patients that have diabetes, and medicines that will prevent blood clots. It could be aspirin, it could be Plavix or Clopidogrel, or for some patients, such as the patients that have atrial fibrillation, we need a strong blood thinner medication. It's important to know that medicines should be taken as prescribed 
And if unfortunately patients cannot afford the medicines or if they cause side effects, it's important to have a good communication with the doctor and the nurse because there are often other ways that we have to deal with these problems. And let me give you an example. One of the most frequent problems that we encounter is for patients that need to take a blood thinner medication. Sometimes nowadays we have newer medications that one of them is Eliquis, one that we frequently use, but sometimes those medications could be cross cost prohibitive for the patients and the family. But we still have our old friend warfarin or Coumadin that is an excellent medication and it can be still used. Now, it's important to know that there could be different options available. And it's important to take the medication as prescribed. The Eliquis, I said that it's an excellent medication, but sometimes we encounter patients that come to the hospital after missing just a few doses of the medication and then they end up having a stroke. So one thing is to take the medications and the other that is very important is the lifestyle changes. So they can do a lot to lower your risk of a stroke because they can help also to control other risk factors for a stroke, such as the blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol. So to lower your risk of a stroke, you should stop smoking if you smoke, get regular exercises, ones that is safe, at least 30 minutes a day on most days of the week, lose weight if you are overweight, also eat a healthy diet. We usually recommend a Mediterranean diet, which is rich in fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy products, and low in meats, sweet and refined grains. Also eat less sodium, that would help to decrease the blood pressure and limit the amount of alcohol you drink. So for a woman, it's recommended to don't drink more than one Greek a day. And let's notice that it's not that I'm recommending to drink, but we shouldn't be drinking, at least women, more than one drink a day. And for men, do not drink more than two drinks a day. So it's important to know that the most important measurements to decrease the risk of a stroke after a TIA has happened or even before a TIA or mini stroke has happened is a good control of the vascular risk factors, the blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, and also to for that uh, good control, we can use the medicines and the lifestyle changes. So it's important to know that a stroke, unfortunately, could be a devastating disease. Nowadays, we have great tools to prevent and to treat a stroke. That's why it's very important to increase a stroke awareness in our community to achieve the best possible outcome. Thank you so much for your kind listening. I would be happy now to take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Dr. Flores Padadura. That was really great. Great information. Thank you so much for that. We do have a couple of questions um, in the queue. Um, the first one, with AFib, how important is taking baby aspirin to lower risk of stroke? So that's a very good question. Sometimes patients don't tolerate or have a contraindication for a blood thinner and they need to take an aspirin. But it's important to know that patients that have an atrial fibrillation and have other important risk factors, such as a prior mini stroke or TIA, have a higher risk for a stroke. So for those patients, it's important to take not only the, not the aspirin, but a blood thinner medication. So blood thinner medication are a strong medications. And as I said before, it could be the newer medications that are Several of them nowadays, the one that we most frequently use is Eliquis, but we can also use medication that we have been using for many, many years that is called warfarin or coumadin. The downside of the warfarin is that patients need to have regular checkups to make sure that the blood is thin enough 
not too much, not too little. And that would be the best way to prevent strokes for patients with atrial fibrillation, taking a blood thinner. But it's true that sometimes patients cannot take a blood thinner because they may have all the medical conditions that put them at a high risk for bleeding. So in those patients, then it's important to take the aspirin. At least an aspirin, other patients are recommended to take a similar medication that it could be a Plavix, although the name is Clopidogrel. Very good. Thank you. The next question, is it a common side effect to see memory loss several months post-mini stroke occurrence? That's a wonderful question. So there are several questions that are in that question. So one thing is like memory loss, but the other thing is that sometimes patient after a stroke or a mini stroke could have some fatigue and difficulties concentrating that could manifest as a memory loss, but actually it's more like the, the fatigue and the difficulties like really concentrate but it depends also what part of the brain has been affected. So the symptoms of the stroke depend on the area of the brain and the size of the stroke that, that actually is affected. There are some areas of the brain that directly have to do with the uh, concentration, with the memory, and sometimes when that is affected, so the patients could have memory changes. It is important also to mention that sometimes patients that have frequent strokes can develop a dementia. So even when Alzheimer's is the most frequent kind of dementia in the population, sometimes patients can develop dementia because of frequent stroke, usually not because of mini stroke without damage to the brain, but actually a stroke that damage to the brain. So the fatigue is frequent after a stroke and most of the time takes a period of time to recover like the level of energy that you had before the stroke. And sometimes the time is even longer than the time that it takes to recover from the stroke symptoms itself. But if hmm. a patient is having some like memory problems that are persisting for a longer period of time, it would be important to talk with a, initially with a primary doctor because there are many reasons why someone could have memory loss. So usually we would recommend to check some levels of the vitamins, some levels of the thyroid hormones to make sure that everything is in a good number. And other times patients would be evaluated by neuropsychologists to try actually to see if it's more like an attention problem or actually a memory loss problem. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the next question, do TIAs always show up on MRI or CAT scan? Wonderful question. So that actually technically is the difference between a TIA or mini stroke and a stroke. So let's say that a patient comes to the hospital with symptoms that lasted for a short period of time. Let's say that someone developed weakness in one side of the body that lasted perhaps for an hour, two hours. So it could be clinically a TIA or mini stroke because the symptoms lasted a short period of time. But actually nowadays with the high potency MRIs that we have, we see frequently that even those patients that have a short period of time of symptoms, when we get the MRI, actually we see an area of damage in the brain. So then technically we would not call a TIA, but a stroke, a stroke which symptoms resolved. That's why it's very important to realize that there is not much difference between a mini stroke and a stroke, because even if the symptoms go away, quickly, there could be a damage to the brain. And most important is a TIA gives us the possibility to do the evaluation and try to find the cause for the TIA and give the right medication. Sometimes patients need surgery of the carotid arteries, other times patients need cardiac procedures to try to decrease the risk of having more events. Very good, thank you. Um... The next question, is there a relationship between migraines and a TIA? That's a very good question. So for 
We have seen that migraine, mainly migraine with aura, is a risk factor for strokes. When we talk about a stroke, we're talking as a group, TIA, strokes. So migraine, mainly migraine with aura, is a risk factor. But that is mainly when women are also smoking and using aura contraceptive. So it's important for the patients that have a migraine with aura to don't smoke, to stop smoking if they do that. And also before starting aura contraceptive, it's important to check with your primary doctor if you do have a history of migraine or even for all the women before starting contraceptive medication, it's important to make sure that blood pressure is in good number because the most important thing is that all these factors together is what increase most the risk of a stroke. Very good, thank you. Um, the next question is in um, is in response to what you were saying about the eloquist, and so they want you if you could clarify about what you said in relation to stopping it abruptly and being hospitalized. Okay, so. Um, I'm not sure what I was describing at that time, but I'm going to to describe different scenarios. So sometimes patients are taking the blood thinning medication for different reasons, helicos or warfarin. It could be because they had a stroke, they have atrial fibrillation and they did the blood thinner. It could be that they have a clot in the heart, a clot in the legs, and then they are in the blood thinning medication. Those are wonderful medications, but unfortunately, every medication has side effects. And the most concerning one with the blood thinners is a bleeding. And sometimes, unfortunately, a bleeding occurs in the brain. So if a patient comes to the hospital with a stroke symptoms and we get the CAT scan and see that there is a bleeding, not a blockage of the blood vessel, but actually a bleeding inside the brain, then most of the time, if they are taking the medication, we will need to stop the medication and even give all the medications to revert the blood thinner effect of the eliquis or the warfarin. And then the risk of bleeding is going to be high or worsening of the bleeding that the patients are having for a certain period of time. So then the recommendation most of the time is to hold on the anticoagulation for a certain period of time. It depends. Sometimes we say like a couple of weeks, four weeks. So the time varies. But usually after a bleeding, we will need to stop the anticoagulation. Also, we stop the anticoagulation sometimes when patients don't have a bleed but have a blockage because unfortunately, even their wonderful medications, they don't prevent strokes from happening 100%. So if a patient, let's say, that has atrial fibrillation, unfortunately being on a good medication as Eliquis has a stroke, sometimes we have to stop the Eliquis at least for a short period of time because after a stroke, that area of the brain is damaged and it has a higher risk of converting into a bleeding and then we have to stop for a little bit. So there are different scenarios. I hope that that answers the question. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So thank you for that. Um, this question, for people who've had a stroke or TIA due to COVID, do they typically have the symptoms addressed in this presentation? Yes, yes. Um, we have seen, unfortunately, many cases and very sad cases because frequently our patients are healthy otherwise that they don't have the typical risk factors that are young and then present with a stroke, sometimes a devastating stroke. And we do all the work up, even in this situation when we know that the patient is COVID positive, we believe that perhaps there could be a relation to the COVID increasing the, the formation of clots, but we do all the evaluation for the other more common causes for a stroke. 
And the presentation is very similar. So patients could be having like COVID symptoms. Most of the times are patients that are sick, very sick from COVID. Other times it's discovered at the same time that patients come with a stroke and then part of the evaluation before we meet patients, we do COVID testing and then we realize that they are positive for COVID. So even though we believe in some of these cases, that COVID may be the mainly culprit, we do the same evaluation and the symptoms, stroke symptoms are similar. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, what about, um, oh, I'm looking for, oh, here. What about pain in your jaw? Is that a sign of a stroke? But usually, um, Pain in the jaw sometimes mainly is described when patients are having like a heart attack that could have a pain from the left side of the chest, radiated to the jaw, radiated mainly to the left arm. So pain in the jaw is not a typical presentation for a stroke. Unfortunately, sometimes patients have a combination of both symptoms, like they could have a heart attack and part of the heart attack as a complication, early complication, they could have a stroke. But other patients have some other causes of a stroke that are related to inflammation of the blood vessels, mainly here in the temples. And that's a, a like more rare cause of a stroke, mainly in older uh, population. And that is called temporal arteritis. And some of the symptoms could be difficulties when patients are like eating, they get tired, they have some pain, but they come with, it comes with all the symptoms. So it's not a typical presentation. It have to be like a combination of all the symptoms for us to be thinking that that could be a stroke related. Um, the next question, if, if, um, if you have a stroke, is a symptom a strong pain in the brain that lasts for a short period of time? Good question. So the most of the time, the strokes that are caused because of blockage of the blood vessels, they don't cause pain. But the stroke that is caused because of a rupture of a blood vessel, one of the most frequent presentation is headache. Usually when that happens, it's a sudden headache. It's not typical like a headache that's building up, but a sudden headache that reaches a very high intensity. And sometimes even with that headache, patients could have even a loss of consciousness. Usually a short period of, of headache shouldn't be related to any that concern in, in the brain. But certainly for patients that have a very severe headache that they have never had symptoms like this before, they don't have history, of headache, it's important to seek medical attention because it could be a bleed and there are different types of bleed inside the brain. And some of them require like surgical treatments or they will require more like reverse the anticoagulation effects of the medication and like just monitor the patients with the blood pressure. So yes, sometimes a sudden onset of a very severe headache could be a presenting symptom for a stroke, mainly a bleeding. Very good, thank you. Um, this person had a watchman put in their heart so they would not have to take blood thinners, but they're wondering if they are at risk for a stroke. But That's a wonderful I, question. And I think that perhaps a cardiologist would be um, someone that could answer a little bit better. So watchman device is, let me tell you to the rest of the audience. So a watchman device is a device that the cardiologist will put in one of the chambers of the heart where the clots, more, the clots more frequently formed for patients that have atrial fibrillation. So they, when they put the watchman device, that structure close up and then the risk of clots decreases. Unfortunately, we have seen patients, the same as I was describing before, 
Sometimes patients that are eliquids, unfortunately, come with a stroke because of a blockage of the blood vessels. And sometimes we see patients that had a Watchman device that also have a stroke because of the atrial fibrillation. So in that situation, when we as neurologists see a patient that has a Watchman device and have a stroke, most of the time we talk to the cardiologist and try to get to a consensus to start then a blood thinning medication. But that the, the guidelines for cardiology uh, have changed recently and they changed very quickly. So I think that this is going to be a very good question to ask to the cardiologists to see, like for the patients that had the Watchman device and hadn't had any other symptoms, if they're going to be recommended the blood thinners even before a stroke actually happens or just the, the Watchman device and aspirin. Yes, thank you. Yeah, the the uh, Watchman device. I've heard wonderful things about them. It's really saving lives. So that would be interesting. And, and let me say one more thing regarding the Watchman device. Excuse me. So, uh, the um, we as neurologists recommend or send the patients to the cardiology to consider the Watchman device, mainly when we have a patient that has atrial fibrillation and then have some other contraindication for a blood thinner. So most of the time, if the patient can tolerate a blood thinner, that's what we recommend. But for other patients that have a high risk for bleeding, it could be some other things like some GI problems. It could be that they have micro bleeds, like a small multiple bleeds inside the brain, and that increases the risk for a high, um, for a large bleed. Then we recommend the patients to um, be evaluated by cardiologists and discuss the the Watchman device. Excellent, thank you. Um, Someone did ask about um, the presentation, and I just want to let the audience know that this session will be recorded, and you'll be able to see it on baystatehealth.org um, and our YouTube channel, Bay State Health, and it'll be shared on um, on our loyalty programs on baystatehealth.org. So you will be able to view this again. Um, Oh, and Clinton is sharing our, looks like our YouTube link with everyone. Um, so it looks like we're just about at the end of our questions. Um, and I want to thank the audience for the great questions and for Dr. Flores for doing such a great job answering them. I appreciate it. Oh, we can ask about... Um, this last one from Diane, is that the one you're looking at, Dr. Flores? Yes. Okay. Uh, Diane was wondering, sometimes when I have a migraine, the whole side of my face, sometimes my shoulder is numb. I've had a TIA in the past, but is this numbness a sign of a TIA or stroke? That's a, that's a very good question, Diane. We um, sometimes, me as a stroke doctor, sometimes I get called to the emergency room for a patient, say that is most of the time young uh, women that come with headache and then some numbness, some tingling, sometimes even a little bit of weakness of one side of the body. If we encounter that situation for the very first time, even if the patient has history of migraines, but have never had these associated symptoms before, we wonder if they could be having a stroke. And we do all the similar evaluation that we have been discussing for a stroke. But then if we see that that patient continues to have similar symptoms with the headache and the workup is normal, I mean, unremarkable for a stroke, then we tend to believe that most likely, even perhaps the first event was not a TIA or a stroke, and perhaps it's just the migraine that presents with those symptoms. And so migraine with those associated symptoms is a frequent mimic for a stroke that we see actually frequently in the, in the emergency room when they call a stroke code on when we see our patients as a follow-up when they are sent by the primary providers. Excellent. Well, thank you, Diane, for asking that. Um, 
And it looks like we're at the end of our questions and we're just about at time. So I want to thank the audience again for their great, great questions and for being here. Thank you, Dr. Flores, for your great presentation, your time answering questions. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great night. You as well. Bye now.